Oh, that's okay. If you have your Bibles with you, why don't you turn to the book of Daniel? We completed our study of 1 Samuel last Sunday, and we are now going to be in the book of Daniel. If you um, didn't catch all of the uh, sermons out of 1 Samuel, I think Andrew has them somewhere on the web. But this morning we are in the book of Daniel, chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, it's found on page 922. Hear then the word of God. Let me just read verses 1 through 5. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Espinez, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language of literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning, and we thank you for your word. And as we come to your word, Father, we pray that You would use it to minister to our hearts and our minds. We often go through a week wanting to hear from you, wanting to know what you require of us, wanting to know your will. And so, as we read your word, Father, help us to listen and to hear you speak to us even this morning. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we are beginning a a new series on the book of Daniel with all that's happening globally with the rise of ISIS and the continuing war with the Taliban and those people being in the news daily and those people sort of declaring a holy war on Jews and Christians around the world, as well as here in our own country, the onslaught on Christian values and a growing intolerance for Christians and the traditions of the Christian faith, I thought it was a good time to take a look at this very important book of Daniel. The book of Daniel contains in the first six chapters a historical narrative of the life of Daniel in Babylon. But it also contains dreams and visions, prophecies in the latter chapters, And to be honest, in all of my years in preaching, I've often sort of shied away from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, Um, partly because I think we as Christians spend too much time thinking about the future in terms of trying to figure out when God is going to come back, and we don't spend enough time talking about having our feet firmly planted where God has put us today. But the other reason is these books are sometimes very difficult books, and to be honest, they intimidate me. (laughs) Thank you, Pam. (laughs) Um, Even though I've studied the books in the past myself, they are daunting books, and so I come before the Lord and come before you rather humbly, knowing that these books have often been talked about, but often hard to understand. And I certainly do not understand in a definitive way all the prophecies um, that are given in the book of Daniel. And I would suggest to you that those who do say that they understand them all um, probably don't understand them any better than you or I. Uh, 
In fact, I would argue that many of the visions, dreams, and prophecies that we find in the book of Daniel have already been completed. They've already been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus the first time, as well as in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. But I also believe that there are things in this book that are applicable to us today, particularly in light of ISIS, particularly in light of our culture sort of imploding upon Christians and Christian values. As I've indicated, most people who study Daniel like to speculate about the future of the world based on the numbers that are given to us in the book of Daniel. And then those numbers that are given to us in the book of Daniel, they try to <laughs> uncover hidden meaning that perhaps is applicable to our political scene today and where the Antichrist might rise or when the end of the world might come. What Christians often forget is that the Bible is not a political almanac. It's not a decoder ring for future events. It's not the Christian version of the gypsy fortune teller. The book of Daniel is none of these things. The book of Daniel is a proclamation of the gospel. And so when you ask what is the purpose of the book of Daniel, the purpose of the book of Daniel is to proclaim the gospel. But let me give you two other purposes of the book of Daniel that are related to that chief purpose of proclamation of the gospel. We've talked about this many times, but let me ask you in sort of a rhetorical way. What is the Bible all about? If the scriptures are not a political almanac, if the scriptures are not a decoder ring to figure out when Jesus is coming back, what are the scriptures? The scriptures are redemptive history. The scriptures are God's record to us of how progressively from the book of Genesis to the coming of Jesus, how God has been working in history to bring about redemption. And where does that history begin? It begins in Genesis 3.15. It begins really before that. But the promise of the Messiah comes in Genesis 3.15, where God <laughs> says to the woman, from your seed will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. Now, God has to intervene and promise the woman that there's going to be a seed from the woman, the Redeemer, to crush the head crush the head of the serpent. Why? Because man has sinned against God. God created man to what? To bring him glory. Very specifically, God created man to rule and subdue the creation. And what that means was that God was king. Capital K. Man was king, small k. And God sent and placed man here on earth that man might rule over the creation, that man might open up the creation to all of its potential so that all of creation would give glory to God. And so man was to work in the area of family. Man was to work in the area of commerce. Man was to work in the area of government and ruling. Man was to work in the area of laws. And man was to work in the area of education so that each area of life would bring honor and glory to God. That was the intent of God creating man in his image to rule over. Man sinned. But God says, listen, I'm not giving up on my plan. I still want man to rule in such a way that man gives glory to me, the Lord God. I'll send you a redeemer. And the redeemer re will restore my relationship with you so that you once again can live for me. So that I again can be your king and then you with a small k can be king over the creation and open up the creation. We've said before 
That's why Jesus prays. When teaching the disciples how to pray, the Our Father, he says, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom, what is God's kingdom? It's his rule. And Jesus taught us to pray that his rule might come here on this earth, not just in church buildings, but in all of creation, that all of creation might give him glory. So when you go to the book of Zechariah, it's no surprise that Zechariah says, God's going to redeem the creation to such an extent that even the pots in the kitchen are going to cry out holy. Every aspect of the creation is to sing holy, holy, holy. And man's task, as given to by God, is to work in the creation so that all of creation brings him glory. Satan, on the other hand, is going to also stay at work. And Satan is going to try to sabotage the work of God in bringing the creation under his kingship. And so how does Daniel fit in this? Well, as we begin the book of Daniel, we learn what happens. God's chosen people, God's people through whom the Messiah is supposed to come, have been taken captive by the Babylonians, causing many of God's people to abandon their faith. It appears as if the kingdom of God can't come. It appears as if the Messiah can't come. It appears as if the kingdom of Satan is winning the battle, even as it seems today. And God's people in the time of Daniel were living in dark days, even as the people of God today live in dark days. So given the historical events, we're forced to ask, How's God going to be victorious in establishing his kingdom? Well, God raises up Daniel. And Daniel, along with his three friends, in the midst of evil, in the midst of wickedness, in the midst of idolatry, begins to wage a holy war. Daniel, in the midst of a pagan nation, in the midst of an idolatrous nation, decides to take a stand for God. And says, in this place, I am going to erect a signpost that God is still king. In this sense, the second purpose of the book of Daniel is that it is a piece of resistance literature. It's a piece of resistance literature because it's supposed to be passed out to other Christians, other believers who are living in pagan cultures, that they might take courage, that they might take comfort in knowing that there are others who have gone before us who have fought the good fight. There are others who have been in battle in pagan cultures, and they've engaged the pagan cultures, and they've stood for the king. And so the second purpose is to be an encouragement to us as we engage our culture, as we engage the world and say, Jesus is king. There is a third purpose related to the second, and that is Daniel's God is our God too. And he's still on the throne. God is in charge. He's in charge of nations. He's in charge of families. He's in charge of schools. He's in charge of individuals. He's in charge of the past. He's in charge of the present. He's in charge of the future. He's in charge of good times. He's in charge of bad times. He's in charge of happiness. He's in charge of sorrow. 
He's in charge of great victi victories and he's in charge of shocking defeats. He's in charge when a child is born and he's in charge when death comes knocking at our door. He's in charge when nations rise and he's in charge when nations fall. He's in charge when the church is suffering and he's in charge when believers are victorious. So studying this book ought to increase our confidence in the sovereignty of God. As we said several months, perhaps a year ago, God is sovereign and he maketh no mistakes. Now, in order to place the book firmly in our minds, here are some background details. Daniel lived about 400 years after King David. He lived about 600 years before Jesus. The book covers the period between 605 B.C. and 530 B.C. When the book begins, Daniel is a teenager. He's probably about 15 years old, perhaps a little older than some, perhaps about the same age as some, and much younger than some. <laughs> but 15 years old. And during his long life, God allowed him to serve under a succession of Babylonian and Persian rulers. And from being an imported hostage, he becomes a trusted prime minister and counselor to some of the mightiest men who ever ruled on this earth. And when the book opens, we find Daniel and his friends being forced from their homes in Jerusalem and deported to Babylon and where they undergo conditioning to train them to serve a pagan king. There are three main players in our book. First is Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They represent world systems that are opposed to God. And we see the term Babylonian and Babylon, Babylon referred often in the scriptures from Genesis chapter 11 from the Tower of Babel all the way to the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, that speaks of Babylon. And throughout scripture, it represents that which is opposed to God. Those systems, those forces, those empires that are opposed to God and seek to do evil in the world. Second, there is Daniel and his three friends, and they represent believers who are in pagan cultures but who decide to stand on the word of God. They trust in God and his word, and they obey, but they're in the culture, a pagan culture. And finally, there is the sovereign Lord who leaves his children in the world and yet purposes to establish his kingdom, and he uses them in a pagan culture to establish his kingdom for his glory. Now, in the midst of this holy war, we're going to take a look this morning at four strategies of how the unseen powers of Satan, the unseen powers of principalities and power, try to undo God's people. The first way, when you're living in a pagan culture, as Daniel was, the first way that Satan and the unseen principalities and powers of the world try to undo you is the world seeks to destroy our heritage, number one. If you go to verse one, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I find it instructive that the opening verse to this beautiful book is about how Satan destroys and comes to besiege the city of the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar surrounds the city, he overruns the city's defenses, and from that day forward and onward, he rules that area. This initial besieging of the city led to the first deportation of Jews. Daniel was a part of this first deportation, but there was a second deportation in 597 B.C., 
And in 586, the, the Babylonians come back and they really pillage the city. So much so that the Temple of Solomon is completely destroyed and the walls of Jerusalem are taken down. Daniel and his friends are taken to Babylon and now they are far away from home. They're far away from those things that are familiar with them. They're far away from the place that they worship God. They no longer had access to the word of God, the Torah. And they're forced to live among unbelievers. But the first step is that Satan comes and he tries to destroy their heritage by removing them from their place where God had given them. He'd remove them from their family, remove them from their place of worship. Secondly, the world seeks to deconstruct our faith. Verse 2, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with the articles of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar took articles from the temple of the Lord God, and he did what? He brought them back to his temple. And why did he bring them back to his temple? Because he wanted to send a clear message. Your God is dead. Your God is dead. He can't save you. He can't help you. We overcame. And those articles that are most precious to you, we have taken and we have put them into our temple that we might use them in worshiping our God. Our God is greater than your God. And by looting the temple, he thought he had hit them at their most vulnerable place. And he defeated God of Israel. And from the world's point of view, if you were living in Jerusalem at the time, you would have thought God had been defeated. Think of our own nation. If ISIS were ever to overtake the United States, what would you think? And so can you trust God when all the evidence suggests and makes the appearance that he's dead? Will you be faithful to God even when your world falls apart? Will you be faithful to God when it appears as if God is no longer in control? Thirdly, the world seeks to reconstruct our values. In verses 3 to 5, the king orders Ashpenaz, the king, the chief of the court officials, to begin to train these young boys and to train them for three years. This is sort of what some have called the operation of assimilation. The king assigns his chief of courts to take them and to give them the very best education. Step one, full scholarship to Babylon State University. Now really there was no Babylon State University, <laughs> but he does give them access to the best education available at the time. He gives them access to all the professors, all the teachings. They would have learned math, they would have learned science, they would have learned history, they would have learned everything, they would have learned various languages. He gives them the best training. Second step is he offers them free food from the king's table. He understood that the way to a boy's heart was through his stomach. Anything on the king's table, you can have. My food is your food. Step three, he changes their names. All of it was a very subtle way of trying to reconstruct their values that they no longer would believe those things that they held to back in ancient Jerusalem. They were now in the new world, the Babylonian Empire, and we think new ways and we think new ideas, and now they have to have their minds retrained. Fourthly, the world seeks to undermine our identity. Verses 6 and 7. Let me read. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, 
Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, from our English text, it would just seem like it's a mere name change, what's in a name, etc. But as in our own culture, names have meanings. The Hebrew names had meaning, and the Babylonian names have meaning. The word Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge, but it became Belteshazzar, which means protect the king. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious, became Shadrach, command of a coup. A coup was the sun god of the Babylonians. Michelle, who is like the Lord, became Meshach, who is like a coup. Azariah, the Lord is my helper, became Abednego, servant of Nebo, another pagan god. By giving them new names, Nebuchadnezzar meant to obliterate their past. The past is no more to signify that there's a new beginning, I'm giving you new names. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't want good Jewish boys working for him. He wanted good Babylonian boys who maybe had a Jewish background, but nonetheless were good Babylonian boys. And note that he doesn't overtly force them to change their religion. The whole process is much more subtle. You think of our own culture. Our own culture doesn't force people not to be Christians. But our own culture, through schools, through social media, very subtly raises up other things that might become our gods. They were being weaned from the past little by little. Soon, Nebuchadnezzar hoped that they would forget it altogether. Most of us know Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the world. I love the way J.P. Phillips' version translates it. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. If you're a Christian living in this culture, the world is going to squeeze you. That's why the role of parents and grandparents is so, so important. Daniel, as we know, was able to stand. But you have to ask why. 15 years old, what teenager is able to stand against Nebuchadnezzar? I believe it was his parents. His parents taught him the word of God. His parents taught him how to trust the Lord. So when the day of testing came, he was able to stand. Parents and grandparents play such an important role in our culture today. Helping our children, grandchildren, stand in the day of trouble. The Babylonian plan is to transform these boys. They isolate them by taking them out of Judah, out of Jerusalem. They indoctrinate them by giving them education that had a Babylonian worldview to it, not a God worldview, a Christian worldview. They cause them to compromise, to eat food from the king's table, and they confuse them about their identity. They gave them new names. It's a good plan, and it worked with some Jewish boys. But there were four boys, Daniel being one of them, who stood against the tide. Number five. The world will not prevail against God's people. The world will not prevail against God's people. When we come to our text this morning, it appears to be hopeless. Here are four young men who are about to take upon themselves the mightiest man in the world at the time, Nebuchadnezzar. Who would have thought? But we know from our history that Daniel and the three boys survived with their faith intact. How'd they do it? I've indicated that part of it most likely was their parents. But part of it goes back to verse 2. I skipped over a phrase initially back in verse 2. And the little phrase is, the Lord delivered. 
What happened to Jerusalem was no accident. The fact that the boys ended in Babylon was no accident. God had not lost control. In fact, it was just the opposite. I'm sure the headlines the next morning in the issue of the Babylonian Sun-Times would have read, Nebuchadnezzar takes Jerusalem. Wrong. He didn't take it. God gave it to him. And from our reading in the book of Isaiah, we know that God had prophesied through Isaiah many, many, many times that unless Judah repented, they would be given to the Babylonians. God gave Judah and Jerusalem to the Babylonians. And if God had not given it to them, they would have never taken it. They could not have taken it. Why? Because God is in control. You know, we as Christians ought to be the most calm people on the earth in these days. We should be whistling down the sidewalks. If ISIS were to attack, we should be, in a sense, whistling. Why? Because we know God is in control. We might say, what is God doing? <laughs> and what's God's plan? And why is God allowing this to happen? But we would not have to ask the question, is God in control? Because the answer is yes. He is in control. The book of Daniel opens with what appears to be a clear triumphant of evil over good. And yet God allows it for his higher purposes. As I think about this text in its larger setting, I ask myself, what set these four boys apart from others? How did they find the strength to survive in a pagan land? And the answer is found when you go into the next section, verse 8, verse 9, where it says, Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat of the king's table. It comes down to an issue of the heart. Nebuchadnezzar could control the environment. Nebuchadnezzar could take them out of their home. Nebuchadnezzar could give them all the education he could give them. Nebuchadnezzar could even change their names. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the power to change their hearts. Their bodies were in Babylon, but their hearts were in Jerusalem. Their hearts were with God. They never forgot, not even for a moment, who they were and where they had come from. Therefore, it didn't matter where they were. It didn't matter what happened to them. It didn't matter that their names had been changed. They were still sons and daughters of the Almighty God. They were still sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty. The faith of their childhood had been tattooed to their hearts. And the mightiest man of the world was helpless to do anything against them. So how will we survive in the continual onslaught of our world this day? The same way that Daniel and the boys did. By putting our hearts in the right place. For us, that means that even though our bodies are here on earth, even though our bodies are living in the midst of a morally depraved culture, even though our bodies are living in a basically pagan nation, our hearts need to be continually focused on God. Our hearts need to be given to him. And if our hearts are given to him, then it doesn't matter what happens here on earth because the world can't touch us because we belong to God. It's easy to be overwhelmed these days. Yet we have the words of Jesus. You know, sometimes, and I get so, so frustrated. There aren't too many things 
that frustrate me, but this is one of them. That we in the church think the church is so polluted that we want to spend all of our time here. And so churches through the ages have built up all kinds of programs to save them from the world because the world's an evil place and I don't want to be there. And yet these are the words of Jesus. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. God has never designed the church to be a place of escape. God has called you and I to be in the world. This is the place where we come to worship God because he's worthy of our worship. This is the place where we come so we can focus on God, so that we know who he is and what he's called us to, be do, to do. But this is not the place where we run from the world, that we run away from the world. In fact, it's just the opposite. We worship God and then we run out that door because we desire to be in the world because the world needs us. The world needs Jesus. God puts us in dangerous places like Babylon so that he can display his power through us. What an important lesson this is. Israel was defeated, but God's people were not. The institutional church in the United States maybe is defeated, but the people of God don't have to raise the white flag. The people of God, the believers, we are the church, and we can stand. This is part of what Jesus meant when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when he uses the word church, he's not talking about buildings. He's not talking about institutions and denominations. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, I will build my kingdom. I will build my people. And the gates of hell will not prevail against my people who are out in the world erecting signposts for the kingdom so that the world knows that I am king. We are called to be in the world. To be in the world and to be sabotaging the works of Satan. And while we sabotage the works of Satan in the world, in the area of education, in the area of justice, in the area of law, in the area of, of business, in the areas of ethics, we erect signposts and we say, this is how it ought to be done. We're a God-centered people and we believe in the word of God and we bring the word of God to the field of education. We bring the word of God to the field of law and we bring the word of God to the field of medicine and we say, this is how it's done when you live under the king. We're to be in the world. And Jesus says the forces of evil will not prevail. That is your hope. Do not run from the world. Run into the world. That's your calling. When Jesus created Adam and Eve. He said, go out into the world and rule and subdue it in the name of the king. Earlier this week, I ran across a reading called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. <clears throat> I'm drawn to it because it expresses the kind of attitude we ought to have when we live in a world that is attempting to overcome us. It supposedly was written by an African pastor who later was martyred for his faith. It reads this way. I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power the die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense and my future is secure. 
I am finished and done with low living. Sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, platitudes, and popularity. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be on top. I don't have to be recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence and his word. I love by patience. I am lifted by prayer, and I labor by his power. My pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is is his kingdom, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, but my guide is reliable, my mission is clear, I cannot be bought, I cannot be compromised, I cannot be detoured, I cannot be lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, I won't back down, I won't let up or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and spoken up for the cause of Jesus in my world. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he returns. Give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he stops me. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. End of quote. When the writer earlier used the word colorless, he was using a word that describes many Christians in our world today. Colorless. We're colorless because we've chosen to blend in, to not stand out. We don't want to offend people, we want to be accepted. We want to be popular. Our colors are not clear because we look so much like everybody else. And yet God calls us to a holy war. God calls us to stand out, to be a people that are distinctive, who live differently. God calls us to a holy war. And so this morning, will you go out into the world? Will you go out into the world with the word of God? Will you infiltrate the territories that God has given you access to for the sake of the kingdom, to destroy the works of Satan, to erect signposts that say, my God is king. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks because you are such a great God and you have given us such a high calling. And we as your people minimize that calling to things that we maybe do on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday evening. And our calling is so much bigger than that, Father. Give us a vision of what you desire us to be in the world. Help us to understand that you desire us to be sons and daughters of the Most High God, sons and daughters living in this world in such a way that we attract people to you because we live for your glory. Give us a bigger vision than we have, Father. Give us a vision for the world for our community, for our state, for our nation. Give us a vision that has us moving out into the world, erecting signposts that says, Jesus is king, our God reigns. Help us in his name.